thanks so much for taking time to hang with me today. I appreciate it. I am so excited to chat with you, David. Thank you for inviting me to sit here and talk. Well, we all know there are a million diets on the market. Uh, keto is, you know, huge right now. And oh my goodness, I could just go on and on and on. Why are you not a fan of that approach to eating? I mean, you're a dietitian. Come on, help us out. We need to lose some weight here. We need to get in shape. Right. I mean, diet is in the name of my profession. So you'd think I'd be all for diets, right? Yeah, you're, you're a professional. You should be a professional dieter. Oh, goodness. Well, I feel like all of us are professional dieters because the diet industry is a 70, $70 billion industry. So there's a lot of people who make their living this way, including we dietitians. And we have like supplements and point systems, meal replacements, uh, coaches, gyms, meal plans, anything that we can think of that people have invented to help us lower our weight. And, you know, it's something that we've noticed, I mean, we can't deny how our body weights have changed over the last few decades. Um, but we started it for health reasons. And what has, has happened um, after my 20 years working in this, in this industry, I've noticed that it's not about health anymore. And it's really just about lowering weight. Um, and it's really hard to tease that apart. And I think it's really important to, you know, we even have gone to doing things like amputating a perfectly normal um, organ, a, a healthy organ in the name of changing weight, right? Um, of course, it's gastric bypass, um, but it's like amputating it's like part of amputate, the organ. You need to amputate my mouth. To, uh, <laughs> to please don't do that. No, please don't do that. No, because a lot of what I think um, has happened is the diet industry has been really savvy, and I often I often refer to them as seductive. Like they have this kind of seductive way of using this tool that we have found through research that doesn't work for most people. Certainly works for some, which you know. That's great. But for most people, um, it's not going to work long term. So looking five years out, most people are not going to be able to maintain the weight that they lost, even if they keep doing the diet. It doesn't really seem to matter in the research. But yet somehow the diet industry and their seduction has convinced us that it's our fault that it doesn't work. And I often think about like, what if I went and, and bought a new phone? And um, as I brought the phone home, it kept dropping my calls. And <laughs> And so um, would I be like, oh, I must be a bad like phone user? No, I would go back to the phone place or the, I don't know, Verizon or Sprint or wherever I bought the phone and say, hey, my phone's not working. And they give me a new phone. And if that kept dropping calls, I wouldn't blame it on myself. I'd say, this is the stupid phone, <laughs> you know? And diets are the same way. You know, it's, a, it's this tool, this product that we buy, but it doesn't work for most of us. But somehow, again, we've been convinced that it's our fault. And you know, we don't want to do the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. I mean, that's, isn't that some kind of saying that we like to say? And so it's important, I think, especially as a dietitian for 20 years, it was important for me to just recognize, you know, diets don't work. And no matter what we call them, whether it's like a lifestyle change or um, just doing something a little different, for most people, in the end, it's just going to lead to weight cycling. And weight cycling is often called yo-yo dieting. Um, and weight cycling, the thing about it that's really harmful that I've come to appreciate as a dietitian is that it promotes things like high blood pressure, high insulin levels, high blood sugar, high cholesterol. It promotes depression. You know, all the things that we will blame on higher weight literally could be caused by the weight cycling, the actual like thing we think we're doing to help weight. And so the thing that um, I remember learning early on is that instead of the diet industry, it really should be called the weight cycling industry. Hmm. I heard that from a psychologist. Her name is Deb Beauregard. And, you know, we, we have other ways to promote health and it can be really hard and, uh, because it's, there's so many different issues that are interwoven with weight besides health, like um, how we treat people of size. And so, you know, walking away from diets, I would love you to run away from diets, but you know, moving away from them can be a really hard sell because we're treated differently when we're smaller. And so that's part of my work is helping people in that place when they've realized diets haven't worked for me. Let's, let's find a new way. And that's where my work is. And that's why I do it. So what you're telling me is that you don't want me to eat a certain way, like eat a, a certain plan in order to, if I do that and I lose the weight, 
if I kept eating that way, I'd gain the weight back. Like, you know what I mean? Like, help me understand this, like how diets don't love work. To you. Yeah. Um, it's like, a really... up, just as a, as a side note, I grew up uh, super skinny. You know what I mean? Like I got made fun of the opposite direction because I was so thin and I'm six, five. I was 175 when my wife and I got married 25 years ago. Um, I got up to 255. I just recently lost 65 pounds um, mm -hmm. by dieting, you know, in a certain way. Um, and, and yet I see myself, I'll go back to eating other ways. I've lost weight in the past. And mm -hmm. so I've been that person, you know, that's gone up and down. And obviously I see other people in my life go up and down. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, help, help me get behind, like, and you say the diets don't work. Is it because, and I, and I'm hearing you say that this is not true, that we don't, um, we don't keep going on them. You know what I mean? Is it impossible to change our way of eating long-term? Or are you saying, even if we changed our way of eating long-term, we're probably going to gain the weight back? Mm. I think what, how you said that, we may need to tease apart a little bit. There's a lot Do of it. nuance yeah. in weight science. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> how we eat, if we change the way we're eating, it just depends on how it's done. And we have to keep in mind too, you know, for you or someone listening, they may have changed their weight through dieting and it may have worked long-term. There's definitely people that have um, and for most people, it hasn't. And so I think that's a really important thing to say. Um, I certainly have worked with people who over the long term, like from a, a you know, bird's eye view, they're waiting, they're, they're waiting, <laughs> their, their eating has changed, but um, the way they've done it has been more aligned with how their body needs it to be instead of following some kind of prescribed way. And I think what's important to tease apart is the way we eat and the food behavior is the loss because this is not a behavior. Weight loss is just, it's not a behavior because people can eat a different way. Like we could all eat the same thing and move the same way and we're still going to look differently and we're going to have different weights. And so when we eat a certain way, it may or may not result in weight loss. And I don't know about for you and your journey, if that was frustrating at times to be like changing your eating and like, oh my gosh, the scale hasn't changed at all. Oh, and even though you may have felt better and you may have like more energy and you may have felt even stronger, but then to see the, the scale not move for a lot of my clients, what happens is that ends up making them go to try harder and to torture their body and do things that were really hardcore that in the end just are not something that they can do because it hurts. Mm -hmm. And even more, the, kind of what you were saying, um, I think what you were saying was what it was about if we continue practicing the same behaviors um, and measuring the weight loss along the way, five years out for most people, even if they're still practicing those same behaviors, the weight will be regained for most people. And that how many of those most people depends on what research you read. Um, you'll see anywhere for eight, from 80 to 95% of people. So, you know, there's some plans like, um, and when you look at diet studies and weight science, it's kind of, it's complicated because a lot of the diet products do their own research or they um, fund certain researchers that are sure. on their board. So it's like, ah, can I really trust the guy whose mortgage right. is paid by this diet company? Right. But even, you know, diet companies who have published research, they'll say 20% are long-term are long-term successful, which means five years out with maintaining that weight loss. So that, that's what I mean that it, um, yeah, so it's complicated. <laughs> I hear you. So people, no, I can hear certainly, you. people can certainly change the way they're eating, but whether they lose weight or not is what is not really promised. Like we can't say with science that we know that it'll stay off, but they, a person can definitely improve their health with behavior change for sure. And so uh, are you saying that uh, weight doesn't matter? I think weight has a relationship to health, but I don't think that's causational or it hasn't been proven yet in research. Proving weight causes health problems has not been done yet, which is really interesting because I feel like that's just how our brains now have these tapes in our head that that's a part of it. But um, weight science research is correlational. And, you know, I, I didn't excel in my statistics class, but I do remember learning in the first day that correlation does not equal causation. And so it just means there's a relationship there. And for a lot of people I work, you know, I specialize in helping people with a condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome, also known as PCOS. And this is a condition that has um, high circulating insulin levels. A lot of us have heard about insulin now. And one thing we know about insulin is that it's a growth hormone. And so people who have this hormonal condition, 
that starts in their hypothalamus, but eventually hormones just go out of range in a way they're not supposed to, and including insulin. And so weight goes up. But people often are told where weight is causing the problem, but really the higher insulin is causing the weight to go up. It's a really just a way to know that something's going on. It's not the cause, it's just an effect. And it's also not the blame. And, and focusing on the weight doesn't change long-term the insulin levels. It's really, we got to figure out how to lower the insulin levels, not the weight. So. so one of the things that you're really bringing to the forefront here is less of a health issue and more of a cultural and perception and a sales issue. I just interviewed uh, last week, Rebecca Bedford. She goes by the um, uh, moniker being an SSBBW, which I had never heard before, which is super size, big, beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. And so I just exploring some of these issues with her about being in her words, an SSBBW. Um, help me understand your perspective on the way that our culture views weight. I, I know we all go, you know, you can boil it down to skinny is better. You know, I mean, it, just bottom line is that's, uh, uh, but, but unpack that for us a little bit, how our culture yeah. sees that. Well, I'm, I'm excited to listen to that interview, by the way. I'm excited that you're having these conversations because they're very progressive and also uncomfortable because they challenge the way that our brains are wired to, to respond to certain bodies. And I think if we even just pause and, and picture in our head, when we think of someone in a thin body, what are the adjectives that we choose to describe? And um, even though I work in this industry of... Um, I call myself a fat activist. I'm someone that believes in body liberation and I believe everyone should feel at home in their own skin. And I still have these really crappy tapes in my head as well. And so when I think of Finn, I think of someone who has all her stuff together, someone who's disciplined, someone who's smart, someone who um, is married, someone who is, uh, has lots of friends. And then when we think of someone in a larger body, the stereotype is often the opposite because of the dichotomy that we live in, right? So it's more um, maybe not in a relationship, um, doesn't have their stuff together, undisciplined, and not smart. And here's the thing. I've worked for 20 years with people who don't have my lived experience. So if someone's listening and they don't know me, I've always been in a smaller body. If you line up all the Duffies, you know, <laughs> all my ancestors, they're probably all looking gangly just like me. And I probably always will be in a smaller body. So my lived experience does not match the people that I usually work with. And so listening to people that I work with in larger bodies who've always been in larger bodies and probably always will be in, and always should be is that, you know, they're, they're smart and they have a lot of things together. They have advanced degrees. Um, they're in marriages, have fabulous sex. You know, they're doing all the things that people think that people in larger bodies can't do. And um, I do think it comes down to this weight science that's been pushed by the diet industry has made us have these stereotypes and um, bigotry really about different body sizes. And we can talk about health and health is really important as a dietitian. I think health is important. And I also think like everyone deserves to like go to the doctor and get comprehensive health care. But the fact of the matter that I'm learning from my clients is that they'll go to the doctor knowing they have strep throat, but then the doctor will give them a diet to follow and even allude that it's because of their size that they got strep throat. No, no, we don't get strep throat from our body size, you know, that doesn't happen. Um, and so what people will do is they'll avoid things. They'll avoid medical care. They may avoid relationships. And um, you can see, have you know, just looking a little bit further down the road, how that en ends up becoming um, an issue where certain bodies then are prized and certain bodies are marginalized. And um, fat bodies have become marginalized in our world, which um, does not promote health because we know marginalization or, you know, when certain bodies live in a way where they're not supported, it promotes high blood pressure, high cholesterol, all these things that we think is behind weight. And it's really unfortunate. And it's going to take a while because I know for me, I've had to really sit with some uncomfortable things that I've done and said about um, larger bodies. And that feels really awful. Um, that's a, a term called cognitive dissonance. Um, I'm, besides being a dietitian, I'm also um, a counselor. And so that was something that I learned a lot about in my counseling training. I have a feeling you did too in, in your pastor training. And, um, you know, th sitting with that uncomfortable feeling of like, believing one thing, but then also another thing at the same time, but they conflict and you have to kind of choose a side. 
And I think that's where we are right now. We have to decide, are we going to support all bodies to get dignified care and just life access? Or are we going to keep pushing this narrative that weight loss is the most important thing? Mm -hmm. You are using a certain term on your website and in your work Mm -hmm. called food peace. Mm -hmm. What What does food peace mean? So food peace is this process. It's a really a journey um, of coming home to your body and feeling safe there. It's a process of un- unlearning what the diet industry has seduced us with and relearning to eat according to what we were born with. Like our body was born with knowing how to maintain our health, how to know when something was fearful or like not safe. You know, we're le- we are born having these instincts. We're also born knowing how to live in harmony and balance and be energized. Um, But again, we've had this like seduction of like, oh, we need to eat this way. We can't trust ourselves. And so um, unlearning this process, it it starts from moving away from diets. I call it this kind of step of respect, like body respect. And um, even if we still want to weigh less or we can't accept our body, it's okay. It's, It's finding a way to just come to terms that diets haven't worked for an individual. And um, again, it's worked for some people, but not for everyone. And for most people listening, they're going to be like, oh, yep, I've tried everything and I've yo-yo dieted my whole life. And so even if a person wants to weigh less, it's like coming to this place of, I just need to respect my body for at least three to six months and sit with the weight science and really explore it from my own history. And what comes from there is this place of really just real, a lot of anger. And I know a lot of your listeners are women. And um, for those of us socialized as girls and women, we often are taught to not hang, handle anger very well. <laughs> you know, I'm even tiptoeing around, around it right now. You know, we're, we're taught that it's not okay to be angry and it can feel weird and uncomfortable, but it's this process of release and the anger doesn't belong on us. Like, like we didn't cause this problem to our body. It's really these systems. And so naming those systems like we've been doing in this conversation. And, and from there, it's a lot of um, food peace then looks like repairing that and how your brain and your body responds to food and then reconnecting to those systems we were born with. Um, and then the last part, because it is a social justice issue, is rallying around other people who are also doing this work. So other people who are in the invested in body liberation, body positivity, um, and really supporting other people and marginalized bodies to find access to food peace. Mm. You know, when you're talking about um, body positivity and food peace and, um, and all all of this, uh, my mind comes to um, the the way that I was brought up. I was brought up in a bit more of a conservative home where we, we really didn't talk about our bodies that much at all. And the way that you're talking about bodies is, is much more of a, a comfortable um, approach to it. You know what I mean? Like how, how would you describe the way that you talk about bodies? Have you always talked about bodies that way? Or is that something that's kind of developed over time in your life? Did you grow up in a home that was comfortable talking about bodies? I was brought up in a conservative home as well. And I went to conservative schooling and, you know, I was, lucky and privileged in many ways because I, again, I've always been in a smaller body. I'm white, cisgendered. Like there's lots of things that I'd never really had to struggle with. And um, I also was brought up in a home where dieting wasn't really talked about. There was some um, talk of certain bodies being better than others, but it wasn't really talked about, but nothing else. There was no deep introspection (laughs) on like trust your body or anything like that. That really has developed over time. And, and um, thankfully I've, been able to stand on the shoulders of other people who've been able to help me to understand what it looks like to feel more liberated in one's body and what people would need. And I have to listen a lot to people who have different life experiences, but certainly it's something that's developed over the last 20 years and studying other people. Um, And here's the thing, even if those of us who are brought in conservative kind of places or people who are brought up in progressive places like fat phobia or the, the marginalization of bodies and or larger bodies rather that happens in every house. <laughs> like it's not something that you'll find um, in most places yet. And that is sad to me because even the most sacred places, you know, if we go to church, I often will hear the person um, 
behind the microphone talking about diets or um, wanting to be thinner or making fun of bodies. Or if we go to a yoga class, you know, often it's, it's talked about or in meditation um, or even like if you want to go to the movies, like fat phobia and making fun of fat bodies is like a really great joke. It's easy joke, right? So um, it's, it takes a lot of studying and learning. And also like, I think it's important to recognize that a lot of us who do this work have either come from a place where we were taught how to diet or it was normal and we're trying to break that pattern. And um, no matter what kind of house you came from, it's possible because you know, especially if your listeners tend to ha have a more conservative foundation, there's people who work in this realm who have a more conservative look, you know, using maybe a Christian based Bible based method. Um, if that kind of conservative is what you're talking about and, and also do this work. Um, so I'm happy to share any of those resources if you or your listeners are wanting to know more about that. Sure. One of the books that I know that was super popular, um, I believe since the mid nineties is all about eating intuitively. Yeah. yeah. Um, talk to me about what does it mean to eat intuitively and how would that help us develop food peace? So intuitive eating, it was written by Evelyn Triboli and Elise Rush. And of course, Evelyn Triboli lives in Orange County near you. So, so um, it is. it was written by two dietitians in the mid 90s, like you said. And intuitive eating is this method that has 10 principles. And it's become a, kind of this like Bible of eating disorder recovery, you know, coming back to yourself. And um, it really is known most for eating according to hunger and stopping when we're full. But of their 10 principles, those are only two of them. You know, the foundation of intuitive eating is something that's really important that I learned from the authors, which is unconditional permission to eat. Um, unconditional permission to eat oh whatever my. food you have around, oh whatever. My. I know that's so scary. What the heck? <laughs> I know it's like almost laughable, right? But it's the thing that most people kind of get tripped on and it's the most important and the shortest step in the process. It's often, um, it just seems the most ludicrous, but what we know from food research, so if you really want to have a good, nice, deep sleep, but for someone like me, it's super exciting. It's food habituation research, which is where people study um, how often someone is exposed to a food and how their brain or their body or their mood is reacting to that food. And, um, you know, when we um, have a food that like maybe pizza, pizza is something that people often feel like, oh, I can't eat pizza. It's too scary. And when you eat it one time and you haven't had it for six months, it's like, oh my Lord, I need to eat lots of pizza and, and a person can't stop. And that's really normal because from food habituation research, what they found is the more a person's exposed to food, the more boring it becomes. And, um, you know, this kind of dips into like food addiction type of research and food addiction research in the beginning was really exciting because it was like, oh my, look at this. Our body responds to sugar or any other foods um, that they're researching, just like cocaine or heroin. And in, when we looked at the research, they were not controlling for certain variables. Again, this becomes very technical in the end. We have to really go down to the nuance level. But in the end, what we found is that research wasn't controlling for uh, habituation. So if someone was uh, not allowing certain foods like chocolate, maybe, um, and then they were exposed to it. Yeah, it was like heroin to their brain. But if they were allowed around that food and they had access to it and they had condition unconditional permission to eat the food, then it was like, meh, you know, <laughs> it wasn't that big a deal. It doesn't mean that we don't enjoy it, but it just is not as exciting. Now, the, the other thing people often bring up was I, if I can eat as much chocolate or pizza or whatever food that a person is really feels addicted to, I'm just going to be so unhealthy. Like my body, like that's going to affect my blood sugar and, and things like that. And what is really important to keep in mind is that if a person just ate pizza every day, all day long, they're going to feel pretty awful. When you think like you'd feel sort of like, sluggish. And the thing that happened when the um, pizza is probably the number one food that you see in food habitu habituation research because of the fact that it, a lot of the research is done on college campuses. And I remember when I was in college, a free meal of pizza was like the draw of all draws for anything. And so they recruit students by saying, we'll give you free pizza for dinner. Come. <laughs> and what they find is that eventually 
people didn't want it anymore. It was become it became something that made them feel gross. And so when we don't blame ourselves for not being able to eat or not being able to stop eating it, and instead just notice how our body responds, we'll be able to self-regulate in the way that's best for us. And it's different because a 15-year-old eating a whole pizza is going to feel a lot different than me at 44 eating a whole pizza. I'm going to feel awful. You know, one piece, I feel great. Two pieces, I'm uh, three, I don't feel good anymore. And um, that's just me, you know, in my body. But when I was 15, no, it, it was energizing all the way. <laughs> so sure, sure. Um, I hope that makes sense. But it's, it's um, intuitive eating really is relying more on your body and um, having permission to do that. And, w- and it gets kind of hairy when we think about social justice issues like access to food and poverty. And so it's also that unconditional permission has to also do with like, hey, you know, you only have box macaroni, ch- macaroni and cheese for the next week because that's all you have in your budget. And that's okay. You know, you, that's you getting enough fuel is the most important thing. And um, so, yeah, that, that's an issue that can, we can talk for hours and hours about. But um, it's really important to have that piece. Again, I know I, it, it's a trip, a place, that unconditional permission, but it's very important. That's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when I was losing this weight that I most recently lost, I've lost a lot of weight, probably thousands of pounds, you know, over the years. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I lost the weight late last year, primarily by eliminating a lot of breads from my mm-hmm. diet, breads, fried foods, sweets. I don't eat a lot of sweets. Mm-hmm. I love fried foods primarily and uh, the breads. So what I found was that when I would eat the breads, well, let me first of all say this. A number of years ago, when I cut out breads for the first time, I realized that I could eat a meal that had quite a bit of uh, volume. You know, whatever. I mean, that sounds weird to say, but you know what I mean? I a, mean. Yeah. A, a, a large meal. And if it didn't have bread, I did not feel heavy or bloated or weighted. Mm-hmm. And so now, I mean, I love bread. I love pizza. I love all of those things. But when I eat it, I feel bad. I like, I feel bloated inside, you know, versus I could have that same uh, hamburger wrapped in lettuce versus the bread and feel completely different. Um, Mm -hmm. So I know for me, that's one of the ways to go. I love the way that the bread tastes. I love whatever it does to my brain, but what it does to my body within 15 to 30 minutes, I don't Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's helped me process some of these things to go, like you said, pizza. I see my son, he's 16. He can eat massive amounts of pizza. Mm-hmm. I used to could do that. And I didn't even feel bad. What? No, it felt fine. But what is that? You know, now I'm old. You know, now I'm like 40, how old am I? 46. And I eat that and I feel horrible. Why, why is that? Tell me, Julie, explain <laughs> to me what's going on in my body. Well, here's the thing. Um, none of us are getting out of here alive, right? So like we are all, all of our bodies are changing. We're getting older and that's not a bad thing, but our body in order to survive getting older, it goes through changes. And um, when we're in a place of growth um, during adolescence, and I really through our 20s, because um, we go through adolescence till at least 25, they're finding now, right? So um, our body uses insulin differently because it is a growth hormone, like we're needing to grow. And then, you know, I'm in, I'm almost 44. So in our 40s, our body just doesn't need it in the same way. And what is really interesting is everyone is different in that regard. And I think what you have found with eating certain foods, making you feel bloated. Um, you know, it, we could even, there could be many different things going on with that because restriction carbohydrates ends up releasing a ton of fluid in our body. And then when we eat flu- um, fluid, when we eat bread again, um, you'll find that the glycogen stores that get fueled end up bringing some water with it. So there'll be a puffiness um, and it'll be softer around our stomach area, but that's not necessarily the means that there's more adipose tissue there. It's just that it's um, more hydrated, really. And our body's prepared for a time where we may need some, a, a spurt of energy if we need to run from a lion, you know, or something like that, like our primal kind of brain. And as time goes on, you know, our body just doesn't need the same amount. And so our eating does evolve. And when we stay connected to it, it's not this like really 
uh, kind of violent assault of like, oh, we must omit it at all. Um, for some people, they're like so afraid, especially like our teenagers. They're hearing from us, unfortunately, that we need to be afraid of getting old because our body doesn't use the food the same and how horrible that is. But when we teach people just to trust their body to tell them what they need, it is a more gradual kind of change. And um, for my clients, again, especially people with this polycystic ovarian syndrome who have a very high insulin level, which is kind of probably behind what I think you're experiencing, um, not the PCOS, but just the insulin level changes and you're noticing I how that I, feels in your body. I hope yeah. I don't have PCOS. That well, there, is a, a male, that would... there is a male version so that they're studying at this point. So I, I think there's another one, but just we all have insulin. And, um, but what, I, what I, happens is for many of them, um, they're told that they should cut out carbs and sugar to treat that condition because of the insulin. But really it's like, feels like torture for them to do that because of when we have insulin that high, it makes every cell in our body crave carbohydrates. And, and, and it's a very primal kind of thing. It's not just you and I having a craving. It's, it's like, I'm going to die if I don't have it. And so when we find ways to lower insulin for a lot of my clients, once their insulin levels are lower, they don't want many carbs, but it's not from a place of like, I can't have it. It's, during it, it may taste good, but about 10 minutes after eating, I feel sluggish. I have no energy and I have to go to work. I can't do that and go to work. So they may have a slice of, of cake at a wedding because it's a wedding and it's exciting and um, it doesn't matter if they're tired afterwards, but having it in the middle of the day when they have to go to court and you know do something where they have to think on their feet, and they're not going to want to have it then because it's going to make them tired and not be on their A game. So it's coming from a different place. I hope that makes sense to you as, as I'm saying this, but um, so the permission's still there, but it's like, well, but do I want it? Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you've come to this place of like, I don't like how I feel and what it may end up happening if it comes from a place of more restriction and punishment, like I can't have it. Eventually the, um, the, the time away from carbohydrate Carbohydrate in particular is one that neurologically we are wired to crave um, because if you think about any culture around the globe, carbohydrates are the foundation. You know, I think about rice in Asian countries. Mm -hmm. I'm half Irish, potatoes. Um, I live in the South, biscuits. Um, so like we have carbohydrates everywhere, right? Um, and what happens is when our body is not getting enough glucose to our brain, we need 40 to 60% of our energy every day in the form of glucose for our brain or we go brain dead while we sleep. And that's not a good thing, right? So what our brain will do is release this chemical called, chemical called neuropeptide Y that tells every cell in our body to crave carbohydrate. And as we get older, we don't need as much. So the craving won't be as high, but eventually it'll add up. And so for my clients, what I encourage them to do when they're in a place of like, well, I need to go, be able to go to weddings and eat the cake. You know, I need to have permission to be flexible. So I can't be all or nothing with it. Um, then we practice allowing it and see and, and let their body go through the reaction, which is exciting, but scary, you know, uh, because the reaction can be uncontrolled eating or binging. And that's just a normal reaction to a deprived brain and that neuropeptide Y. But um, over time, it does like it does go away. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's, those are my thoughts on that part. Um, clear as mud, I bet. Right. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. So, so what if, what if I don't want to diet? I, I've yeah. tried dieting in the past, but yet I don't like the way that my body looks, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, whether I, uh, you can call it cultural, you can call it mm -hmm. personal. Mm -hmm. I just don't like the way my body looks. What, what would you suggest? i most people I work with are in that place. They're in that place of, I don't want to diet anymore because the thought of going on another diet is just exhausting, scary, and I know it's not going to work, but I don't like my body. I hate my body or, you know, somewhere along those lines. And I think it's important to question, when did you learn that your body was wrong? Who did you learn it from? How long have you known this? And what's the reason behind it? And for people, it's going to be different. You know, people of color, people who are living in poverty and in a larger body, it's going to be different than someone who looks more like me in a larger body who has, is white and financially able to have some flexibility. Um, you know, it's going to be a different kind of experience to move away from diets. And what I often will kind of use as my bartering or I don't know, like, hey, just try this for a little bit is 
let yourself not diet for three to six months. Try to do some of the work of healing. And again, it's like more of respecting your body and sitting with the weight science that I was talking about early, earlier and acknowledging that your body shouldn't have to be tortured to experience health and um, come to peace with that. Maybe this is where what your body is going to look like. I don't know what it'll look like on the other side. Some people's weights go down with this, but some people's don't. And some people's bodies weights go up. It just, it just kind of depends. We can't predict it. And so for now, it's almost like, what can you do just to stop pursuing weight loss and um, learning where you got all this information? And from there, my hope is, you know, I believe in body autonomy. Like people get to decide what they do next. So if they want to diet, they want to diet. Um, and if they're wanting to take another step, I'm like, I'll hold your hand. Let's just do the next step as big or as little as you want to go to help you feel more at home in your skin, whatever your skin and earth suit looks like. Mm -hmm. So much of what you're talking about feels like a lack of peace that if I don't like my body, if I'm, if I'm restricting like, Oh, I don't, I can't eat this food or I'm on the stringent diet or whatever. That's so non-peaceful. Like that's so stressful, so much anxiety. It feels like, you know, it, it, whether it's in the way that I'm eating, but also the way that I perceive my body, I recognize as you're talking, I'm like, yeah, I have some lack of peace in my life about my body, you know? And I'm, I'm wondering what percentage of our culture has a lack of peace when it comes to their food and their bodies. That percentage has <laughs> got to be 99.5. At least. I haven't met anybody yet who feels totally okay in their body all of the time. I don't think we live in a world that allows that anymore, which makes this very complicated. That's why that unconditional permission to eat concept is so hard because we really are having to give up a lot to do that. And, you know, the thing I think is tricky, what you're talking about, about like the chaotic side of you know, dealing and living with food in this kind of diety way is in the beginning. It's not like that. Right. I mean, I feel like the beginning of a diet is exciting and almost like a calm. It's hopeful. And again, I always think it's seductive. You know, it's, Ooh, if I do this, everything's going to fit into place. I'm going to get X, Y, Z. I'm going to finally be healthy. Maybe that's part of it. Or I'm going to find a partner. I'm going to get a job. I'm going to get um, noticed. Um, I'm going to be able to go um, travel the world because there'll be seats to accommodate my body. Um, so I think in the beginning, it feels really nice. But mm -hmm. then continuing on, you know, usually about the six month in, some people it's a, more like three months in to a diet, it can become quite uncomfortable and chaotic, certainly at the year mark. Um, for again, at least 80% of people, it's going to feel um, chaotic, like you said. Mm -hmm. And then to have to do that over and over again, that is exhausting. Right, right. So the controlling part, the part where I feel in control, the diet basically mm -hmm. allows me to feel like I'm in control. Mm -hmm. And then when I don't feel like I can control it anymore, that's where I feel like the anxiety and stress and chaos comes in. Yes. I call that the, the should eat fantasy compliance. Like it's like, that's the villain here. It's like, we feel like we should, if we just follow these rules and comply, we will have we will have all the things we want. If we just comply, we'll be able to get it. Um, and it's, it's like this monster, basically, it's convinced us all to do it. And it's going to give us everything we want. But really, in reality, it just makes us feel awful. <laughs> so when you scroll through social media, see advertisements on billboards, uh, open up a magazine, watch a movie, and you see this messaging, because the messaging that you're talking about is everywhere, absolutely everywhere. How do you personally deal with that? Like, do you, are you, you know, is it, how do you deal with it? Yeah. How do you process it's that? It's exhausting. I, dude, the most challenging part for me is I have two children. They're 11 and six. And so they're learning about diet culture and um, how certain bodies are prized of others. But I've also taught them to spot those things. And um, so they'll name when they, they hear um certain bodies being made fun of in a movie and they'll want to walk out. They don't want to, they don't want to hear it just like how we would hear other kind of bigotry and not be okay with it. But yeah, it's really, really hard. I do uh, go to therapy. Um, I get supervision, which is, you know, is a therapist getting your own therapy through someone helping you do better therapy. I don't know. <laughs> so 
sure. Um, I do a lot of my own work um, and I rest a lot. I take naps <laughs> and I make sure that I have time in the day to just sit and be. And honestly, I don't read a lot of magazines. Um, I don't watch a lot of TV. Um, I am, I don't use a lot of the media that is going to make my body feel less than, um, I'm starting to get more, um, exposed to feeling not at home in my skin because of the aging process. And I don't like that. And, um, I want to stay in my body and embodied. And so I just re don't want to, I don't want to consume that kind of media. So it doesn't mean I don't consume a lot. I mean, honestly, when it comes down to it, lots of like books, whether they're like just regular novels or self-help books you know, that stuff's in there and it's disappointing, but, um, it also means that there's a lot of work to do and I will work as long as I want. <laughs> it's gonna, there's lots and lots of stuff to do. One of the things that you've mentioned in our conversation is polycystic ovarian syndrome. And I know you have an online course that helps people that are experiencing that. Tell us, first of all, just re-explain what PCOS mm -hmm. is and how your course might be able to help someone who's dealing with that. So uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS is a, it's an endocrine disorder that has metabolic and reproductive consequences. So a lot of people connect it with infertility. It is the number one cause of ovulatory infertility. And it also affects things like mood because it starts in the hypothalamus. It's mostly genetic, but unfortunately because um, insulin levels are involved, a lot of people end up being at higher weights and they're told that they should just lose weight to treat it or their weight changes and no one investigates to see if this condition is going on. And it ends up perpetuating this really torturous kind of cycle with food and exercise. And um, people literally practice an eating disorder called anorexia nervosa in order to treat the condition, but it, they still feel crummy. And, um, you know, when I started specializing in eating disorders, that, that really you know, after I finished my degree in counseling um, and practicing as a dietitian for a while, that's all I really wanted to work in. But I kept seeing these people with PCOS and I'm like, I need to figure out what to do. And, um, you know, I, I came up with this 12 step system that I help people go through to help promote health with PCOS. Cause I, you know, that's still something that I'm helping with and help move away from diets and, um, at the same time. And so it's an online course that, um, a person can just download and do whenever they want. And there's monthly Q and a calls so we can have check-ins, but, um, it's something that it's really nice to hear because I've been working with people individually. Um, uh, it's, it's really cool to see people going through these 12 steps, um, all over the world and able to feel more at home in their own skin and basically show to their doctor, you know, whether or not they lose weight, they're like, I, my fertility is improving. I have more energy. Insulin levels are down. I don't have diabetes, like all these things that they've been so afraid of. They're able to find ways to treat it without dieting and really in healing instead. And so uh, there's um, more information on it at PCOS and foodpeace.com. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely point people toward that. Now, if somebody uh, maybe hasn't been tested for PCOS, is, is there a test? Like, how you know, how would somebody I wish. go, oh, I'm, <laughs> it's, more, it's more a combination of symptoms? Is that how? Yeah. Yes, so far it is. It's unfortunately a really um, poorly understood condition. Um, one in five of those who are... Um, uh, biologically female at birth or named as female at birth are affected by this condition. So it's something that a lot of people experience. And um, unfortunately, not a lot of research dollars are going into it. But for right now, it's really just a set of symptoms and a diagnosis of exclusion, which, um, you know, it, that, that stinks in itself. But um, it's really if someone has um, signs of high androgens, um, so their testosterone levels are high or other androgen levels. So they may have extra hair on their face or losing hair on their head. And um, that's a sign of it. Also, um, just issues with either fertility or their periods or things like that. That's another sign of it. And um, if you if you go to my website, which is just juliedillonrd.com and then slash PCOS, you'll find some more information about how to actually figure out if you have it or not or how, what to take to your doctor to see if you have it. Great. And I know that you also have a specialized version of the course for dietitians. I so do. So we'll make yeah. sure that we link to both of those for people. So Julie, I'm uh, very intrigued by your work. I think what you're doing is great. Do you take clients um, from a distance? Do you, or do you only work with people locally? You, you do? No, both. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So we'll make sure that if you're listening and you are one, if you sense that you might have an eating disorder, or if you are um, wanting to deal with, um, well, intuitive eating and developing food peace in your life, uh, we want you to get in contact with Julie. So Julie, wow, look at you doing amazing things in the world. Crazy. 
helping, <laughs> helping out, helping us all feel better about ourselves and getting healthy and not dieting. No more dieting. You can eat whatever you want. I'm going to go have something fried today for lunch. <laughs> and then let your body tell you how you experience it. I'm going to feel horrible, except when I'm eating, it's going to be so fun. <laughs> I told my wife, I joke with my wife. This is not a joke. This is not a joke. For, I, I, my, my sense of humor is a little off. Like it's a little wacky. Um, if you listen to any of our episodes, I'll usually ask something crazy. But I told my wife after we eat a big meal, I go, you know, I should really start throwing up afterwards. I don't know what you call that, but I think that would be good for me because then I could eat more. And then she just says no. No, no. That's uh, seriously one of the worst things a person can do. Um, and it doesn't work anyway. That's the other part of it. But yeah, that's uh, a serious pathological condition. Yeah, it is. I know. Mm -hmm. It's but that funny. that that part of um, the brain giving you that as an option is a part of chronic dieting. Oh my gosh! Now you're diagnosing <laughs> me. Look at this. You're coming after me now. Sometimes our humor tells us our answers. You know? Oh man! Yeah. All right. All right. Well, I'm gonna go suck on some celery. Uh, uh, well, I hope it gets easier. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, Julie, I, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you.